I want to speak to you today on the subject of fire from heaven. A fire from heaven. And uh, let me give you the outline real quick. Number one, Elijah stood in the gap. Elijah stood in the gap. Number two, Elijah challenged the false prophets. Elijah challenged the false prophets. And number three, Elijah had faith in God. Faith in God. It's a familiar story, I know, but it just, I tell you, it's just really an uplifting story. Uh, just, I, just studying it again and go over it again, uh, it just really blesses my heart, and I hope you too will be blessed uh, tonight. You know, for three years, Elijah had hid himself from uh, King Ahab because he knew if King Ahab had found him, he, he and Jezebel would have put him to death. Eli Elijah had pronounced a drought to King Ahab and the people, people of Gilead because they were allowing their people to worship other gods, and uh, Baal was the one specifically that they were worshiping. Elijah found Obadiah, who was in charge of the King Ahab's household, uh, to set up a meeting with King Ahab. Obadiah, who feared God, he had 150 prophets from Jezebel in caves to protect their lives. Obadiah was afraid uh, King Ahab would kill him if Elijah did not show up or, or not pronounce the time for the drought to be ended. Let's look at this incredible story from the Old Testament hero of faith, Elijah. And he is uh, probably the most famous prophet uh, in the Old Testament. Elijah stood in the gap. Look at verse 5, 18, no, excuse me, 18 verse 15. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely uh, present myself to him today. And again, you have to understand, uh, Elijah was following God in all of his instructions. He told him where to go. Uh, he told him who to stay with. Uh, you know, the widow uh, and the oil, the issue and the miracle there, and that all is going on. So Elijah, as a prophet, not just because he was a prophet, uh, but he was God's spokesman for that time. Uh, and it says, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Abad, Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? Now that's the king talking to him, all right? And then he answered and said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. And he is basically telling King Ahab, you know, you, you are the one, you are the problem, you are the reason the drought has come. And, and he was, Elijah was God's spokesman uh, to uh, King Ahab. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 450 prophets of Asher Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And folks, we, uh, we know Jezebel and, you know, uh, we, we know how wicked she was. She wa was killing uh, the prophets of God and uh, she was ruthless and, you know, if you just follow her, the whole story, you know, uh, God through, through Elijah said how she was going to die. And uh, she did die a violent death. If you want to follow that sometime, and that's for a, another time. But the point is, Elijah was standing in the gap for the children of Israel. They were not doing what was right. They were listening to the wrong person. Uh, they were not obeying God's commandment. And folks, even as a prophet, you know, prophets proclaim. You know, sometimes people think prophets are ones that tell the future, all right? But it's, it's more uh, God's spokesman than anything else. So uh, Elijah was standing in the gap for God's children. Then it says in verse 20, so Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? And folks, I am telling you, it is no different today than it was back then. You think about 
uh, the government, you think about all that's going on, you think about all the sin that is going on, you think about everything from abortion to homosexuality to all these things that, that, you know, that's going on. And by the way, you know, even in all the gods, and I'm talking the little gods, all right, you know, there's only one God, big G, capital G is God, our Heavenly Father. But there's all these little gods, and it's almost like they've run in cycles, okay? And they've, they've come back. And when it, it reminds me of the, uh, Jesus talking, uh, you know, in, in the Gospels, where a, a demon had taken over a household, and they threw the one demon out. And then what, remember what happened? Seven more demons came back to that place. And if that... I was just, I, I was reading that earlier, uh, you know, it's been probably about two weeks ago, and I, I got to thinking about America, and I, got, I, I thought, that is exactly what's happening now. Satan knows his days are numbered, and he, you know, he's just one person, but there's demons everywhere. And what they've done, I am telling you, they have sent seven times as many in our days. You think of all the crime, all the hate, all the killings, okay? Just things that you, you, would never, you would never have thought. And folks, I am telling you, Satan is alive and well, and we need to understand, uh, standing in the gap is praying for God's leaders. Standing in the gap is praying for our country. Standing in the gap is praying for this election, Standing in the gap is praying for those who have been seized by Satan and his demons that are influenced them and, and doing the wrong thing. And if there's one thing, I, if you are living and breathing, you can stand in the gap for someone. That's why, folks, I, that's why we still have a prayer list. That's why we still go over it on Wednesday nights. That's what we're doing we are standing in the gap for folks who need prayer. And that's what uh, Elijah was doing. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered not him a word. And you know what I say about that? No answer is an answer. Do you hear what I said? It's when we don't stand in the gap. It's when we don't stand up for what's right. It's when we don't, and again, you don't have to be hateful about comments about evil and wrong things. We need to say, thus saith the Lord. This is what the Bible says. So he's saying there's these two opinions out there. Y'all are listening to the wrong one. And he point blank asked them, gathered the children of Israel and asked them, and they said not a word. Hold your finger there and go back to Joshua with me. Joshua. Joshua 24, verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord. Okay, respect the Lord. Honor the Lord. Honor his word. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. All right? We, he doesn't need part-time Christian folks. He don't, he don't need uh, folks that, you know, well, I go to church when there's nothing else to do. All right, fear the Lord, servant in sincerity. Truth is the truth of God's word. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Folks, there are so many gods. All right, the God of money, the God of pride, uh, the God of fame, the God of, you could just think these little gods, they are everywhere. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Folks, we have to make a decision. And that decision should be to serve our Lord and Savior. So the people answered and said, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, 
who did those great signs in our sights and pervert, uh, preserved us along the way that we went among all the people through, through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwell in the land, and we will serve the Lord for he is our God. Folks, we need to say that in our own lives. We don't need to just put it, I mean, when you come in my door, on the first wall that you see is that scripture right there, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's not just a plaque, okay? It's not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that we look at. You know, we need to stand in the gap, all right, for Christianity, okay, uh, for persecuted Christians, uh, for they just, I could just go on and on and on about standing in the gap for people. So uh, Elijah says, basically, serve the Lord. So we see Elijah stood in the gap. Number two, Elijah challenged the false prophets. Challenged the false prophets. Then Elijah said to the people, I am alone, left a prophet of the Lord. And again, you can't, I mean, what he's talking about is at this time, okay? There were other prophets, okay? There were other prophets. I mean, they hid some in the caves. And, and again, you know, to, to get away from Ahab and Jezebel, uh, they had to hide people. And folks, we have missionaries like that. Folks, there are missionaries that are in, in, in land that, you know, if they're carrying a Bible, you could be jailed for that. All right? And all that. And, and so it, he wasn't saying, I'm the only one serving. He was saying, I am the only one here this day. All right? And folks, there's going to be times in our lives that we don't have the majority. That there are going to be, uh, you know, maybe two or three or even four that go against what we say or against who we are. And folks, we need to stand. Yeah, all right? First, we stand in the gap, and then we stand up for God. We need to stand for God. And I will say this. I really believe, Scott and I were talking about this the other day. Folks, it's going to get where it's going to cost you something to serve God. I'm talking real persecution where you could lose things and you could, you know, be blackballed and you could uh, be jailed. I do believe if the Lord tarries, I believe with all my heart, we are going to see some persecution like we've never seen in the United States. Because evil, it, you, you can just sense it, folks. It's escalating. They, they hate Christians. They don't want to hear about the Bible. They don't want to feel guilty about what they're doing. And it's just escalating, folks. And we are, I believe, going to be persecuted. And it says, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. And again, from what I see, you know, he, he asked for 850 of them to be there, but, but the other group didn't show, uh, Asherah's group. But it's still, you look at the odds, 450 to 1. Well, I got news for you folks. <laughs> if that one is a prophet of God, if that one has God on their side, then you, you know, people, are, you know, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not in any way for sports betting, but nobody would take the side of one of 451 odds. But folks, with God, all things are possible. We're ne I, I, I'm just telling you, just like getting into the land. All right. Remember 12 spies? What did 10 of them say? Man, we can't do that. You see their plate? You see their, their, their houses? Do you see the walls? Do you see how big they are? Did you see the fruit there? Did you see all, that, all that's going on there? <coughs> Excuse me. And, and they said, we're not going. And two people, Joshua and Caleb, said, listen, we need to go. We need to go. And you know the end of that story because they didn't follow God's instruction I mean, basically, they all died in the wilderness. Verse 23, therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves. Cut it into pieces, lay it on the wood, put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bull 
and lay it on the wood, but no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of, my, name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. Where did he get that plan at? All right, I don't think that was in his seminary course anywhere, all right? What did he do? He listened to the Lord. Folks, if you will listen to God, you will know when to act, you'll know when not to act, you'll know when to speak, and you'll know when not to speak, okay? There are times that you are just better off not even speaking. I'm all for, uh, you know, standing up for the Lord, all right? But I'm just simply saying uh, that, that he knew without a shadow of a doubt uh, that he needed to do this. Thank you, Lonnie. I appreciate that. Well, I thank God for our security team, don't you? I get excited when I, when I read stories like this, man. I get fired up. I don't know about you. And I'm hoping up in heaven, he's got this big replay. You know, this screen, you know, bigger than this church, a screen where we can just watch all these things. You know, he, God can do anything he wants to do. Probably not going to happen, but let's, let's say it might. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. All right. Verse 25. And now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first for your many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull that was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning eat, uh, even till noon saying, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice and no one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. Now you'll, you'll see things escalating here. A simple prayer obviously didn't do it. So they just start jumping around, okay, thinking, you know, maybe we need to get his attention. Maybe uh, the dance will help, okay? And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud. He's saying, cry louder. Uh, for he is a God, either he is meditating or he's busy. Maybe he's on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and must be in awake. Now, again, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't think he did something wrong. But, you know, you, 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 you have to understand he's simply saying and, and illustrating why is it your God speaking? Okay, giving excuses. Uh, for, the, for them. Verse 28, so they cried aloud. Now here's where it just gets crazy, folks. All right? And cut themselves. What kind of God wants you to cut yourself? And folks, I'm telling you, I don't even have the time to get into satanic rituals that go on in the United States of America. It's crazy what some people will do. All right? I mean, they literally harm their body, scar their body, and end up in hospitals because, and here's what I've heard in testimonies, there was a voice telling me, this is what I need to do. Well, folks, we know, I mean, if they're serving the God Baal, we know it's not God, all right? And really, folks, Satan's plan in life is to destroy people, to just destroy, suicide, Suicide. He take. He he convinces somebody that that's the best way out. Drugs, overdose. He knows. Hey, I can get a soul on this, you know. And and again, this, this it just gets crazy here with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. Didn't say just bled a little. There were pools of blood at their feet. And folks, that's what Satan want to do. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your testimony. He wants you dead. And when midday was passed, you say, well, why, Mike? Because you're going to join him. All right? If you don't have Christ, you're going to be where he is. And when midday was passed, they prophesied into the time of the evening offering sacrifice, which is around 3 o'clock, and there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. It was quiet. There was no fire. There was nothing that was happening because they serve the wrong God. 
It reminds me uh, earlier in Samuel, 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> it says, and, and we know what happened. Uh, David came on the field and the Philistines, and they, he saw some big goon up there that was nine feet, nine inches tall. And, you know, all of them were sitting around thinking, man, you know, who wants to take on him? And nobody would do it. What did David say? I, man, I'll do it. And they basically said, no, you can't go out there like that. Put on the armor. Well, the armor, he couldn't even walk in it. He was a young lad. And, and, and he, I, he literally got mad, David did, and said, you're not going to talk to my God like that. And folks, I am telling you, if someone uses God's name in vain in my presence, I don't care if it's family, I don't care if it's whoever it is, my response is, please don't take God's name in vain. And everybody around here knows I'm, that I'm a, a preacher. And they, I, they've even said, oh, I forgot you were a preacher. And I'm like, no, you haven't. It's inside of you and it came out of you. Okay, man, take up for God. That's what David was doing. He was saying, man, you're not going to talk about my God like that. But look down in verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. What'd he do? He described. He was straight up saying, man, you're talking about my God. We're going to throw down. We're, we're throwing. And again, I'm not telling you to fight people over God. All right. And it says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass of the camp, carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And even, uh, you know, Goliath was making fun of him. You send this little peep squeak out here, you got to be kidding me. All right. And folks, I am telling you, God will fight our fights for us. God will be with us. There's nothing impossible for our God. And then verse 47, then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not say uh, with the sword of the spear, for the battle is the Lord. I mean, Goliath's spear was taller than David. And he's just basically saying, your spear is not going to help you. That is confidence in God. It's not arrogance. All right? And it says, and he will give you into our hands. And we know the rest of that story. Five smooth stones and a slingshot. One of them hit him right square, and that dude plopped. He plopped over. And you know the rest of that story. I mean, they... They all went out. They defeated the Philistines, and uh, God got the victory there. So we see Elijah stood in the gap. Elijah challenged the false prophets. And the third thing, Elijah had faith in God. Look at verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. Why? Because, you know, if you sit there and watch these guys act, you know, do what they did and just tear the altar up, cut themselves on all this. You know, some people had lost interest in that. Uh, you know, there was a mess probably around the altar. And it says, so all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. He, that was a representation of the 12 tribes of Israel, whom God is their Lord and Savior. Then with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two uh, seeds of seed. And again, he is just listening to God. How did he know? Because see, he didn't, he didn't dig a trench early, all right? He didn't do it. And, you know, while they were there, he stopped and dug this trench. Why? Because God told him to do it. All right. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. 
Could you imagine being in that uh, audience that day? Could you imagine what the people were thinking? What in the world is he doing? How is this going to work? Logic, mankind, the laws of science or the laws of whatever you want to say goes totally against what he was doing. But folks, I am telling you, when God tells you to do it, you need to do it, and you need to do it the way God said. Don't you alter it up. Don't you change things. Don't you go halfway. If God tells you to do it, you do it. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. Man, I'm telling you, folks, that's just incredible. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, what time was it, folks? It was getting dark. What was, he, what was he fixing to do? He was fixing to pray to his God. Folks, he wasn't showing off in this prayer, okay? He wanted it very clear who was going to make this thing work and make this happen, okay? Elijah couldn't do that on his own. And folks, I am just telling you, that's, again, that's why I think prayer is so important. That's why we're going to keep it here on Wednesday night. That's why we as a church have been blessed and we have seen God move and we have seen many prayers answered. Why? Because, folks, we need God. We can't do it without Him. Okay? We're mere men. We're mortals. And I know we're filled with the Spirit. I understand all that. But it is God that made this is this can't happen. This logically, there's no way you can you could reason with a scientist or somebody that this could ever happen. And then he said out loud, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day, you are God in Israel. What he's doing? He's testifying. He's telling everybody. Hey, this is not me. This is not Israel. We are God's chosen people, but this is God. And I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. That's so key, folks. That's why we need to stay prayed up. We need to stay spirit-filled so that we know when God speaks and we know that it's right if God speaks it. And it says that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When I was growing up, I'll just tell you right now, I wasn't the smartest cookie. <laughs> I wasn't the sharpest pencil because I had dumb ideas when I was young. And one was, if you're building a fire and your parents aren't around, if you pour some gasoline on that, it'll do better. Okay? I had two things. I had no eyebrows and I got a front haircut. I mean, this, what, this is what it makes me think of. All right? I'm just like, you know, and I did put the gas way away from me. I was smart enough to do that. And I got up to that deal. I lit that deal and I threw it on. And all I heard was, whoo, and a pop. And I find myself about three feet behind me thinking, man, man, it's hot. You know, and I don't think I was ever on fire. But I'm just telling you, it scared the, I mean, I was I thought, oh my goodness, I am going to die right here with this five. It was the dumbest thing, well, one of the dumbest things I'd ever done. And I, this, this, what it, this is what it reminds me of, okay? Man, when that fire from heaven came down, and folks, you know, we, we normally don't associate fire with heaven, okay? 
But, that, but God wanted them to know, hey, I'm going to light that fire. I am going to light that fire for you. Okay? Is that not what happens in our own personal life? God looks down from heaven and says, there's an empty person. There's someone that doesn't have any purpose. There's a lost sinner that can't save themselves. Save themselves. And boom! And it's not fire. I mean, you can say fire, but it's the Holy Spirit. He puts inside us, us the Holy Spirit. I can, I can never get away from that time uh, after. I mean, we're almost into Easter now. After, and Jesus is walking with them two dudes, and they're going down. And they said, I don't know what happened, but there was a fire inside of us. I can tell you what happened. One is they walk with Jesus. Two is he put that fire inside of them. And do you know some of the happiest people on earth? I love to be around new Christians that just figured out that I got saved. All my sins were forgiven. Man, they, they, they ain't Debbie Downers anymore. You know what I'm saying? I mean, sometimes we've been saved so long, some people act like they've gotten over it. You know? And we shouldn't be that way. This fire lit. I mean, this fire proved who God was. And it says, and the Lord, he is God, and the Lord, uh, he is God. There was no doubt right then Man, God made a believer out of all those folks. All right, the same God that parted the Red Sea, the same God that had got them through all this stuff was proving that, listen, there is nothing that God can't do. Because we live in a world of can't do's anymore. I, I, I can't do that. I just can't. I, I can't do that. Well, folks, you, you, are con you are saying something against Scripture when you say, I can't. Because the Scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, am I going to get up and be a soloist like uh, Steve? No, no, not in this life. But I'm telling you, I'm going to sing with him in heaven. I want to sound just like him in heaven. <laughs> I can do all things through Christ. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal and do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kish Kishon and executed them there. Folks, fire consumed everything. God's power was seen in a mighty way. James chapter 5, James chapter 5, verse 16 Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Folks, we need to stand in the gap for people. There are people who are hurting. There are people that are lost. There are people, Christians that are backslidden. There's so many situations. Our world has gone crazy. Stand in the gap. Pray for one, uh, one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Effective. Okay, know who you're praying for. Know what you're praying about. Pray without ceasing. And that's what we do a lot of times in life. We, we get all fired up and we get under a burden. And if that's not, prayer's not answered very, fairly soon, we just quit praying. The effective fervent prayer. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the, heavy, and the heavy, heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Now faith, verse 1, is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Folks, you can't see faith. You exercise faith. You believe. You trust God. You know that he can do this. And then look down in verse 6. But without faith, we know what we can do with faith, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Folks, we need to be men and women of faith. We need to live in faith. We need to pray in faith. We need to walk in faith. For he who comes to God must believe. Must is an absolute, folks. All right? It's not just wanting to stay out of hell, okay? It's not. It's a trust. It's giving your life to him. Must believe 
that he is. He is what? Well, I don't have time to go over the list of what he is. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. Uh, he's Lord. He's Savior. He's Master. All right. He's King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Folks, seeking him is in prayer, standing in the gap for others. Then Mark 9, and I'm through. Mark chapter 9. And remember before what was going on here, a uh, man brought his son, had a mute, mute spirit and, you know, had kind of seizures type things that going on. He explained, man, he throws himself in fire and he does all this stuff. And he took him to the disciples and the disciples couldn't, couldn't do it. You know, even though uh, Jesus had gave them power and, uh, you know, and I believe it was apostolic power. I really do. And they couldn't do it. And this man you know, saw Jesus and just said, hey, man, I need some help here. You know, this, my son's going to die. He's going to throw himself into water. He's going to throw himself into fires. And, and then he, he said, how long has this been happening? Verse 21, from childhood. In the, verse 22, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, if you can believe. Folks, believe God. Believe God's word. Believe that God is still in the miracle business. All things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Oh, folks, that's such an important phrase. I really believe in our own personal lives. We as Christians ever once in a while needs to cry out to God when he comes through for us, when he does things and we maybe not, we, we, we had doubt in our minds or we wasn't sure. We need to cry out like this. This man says, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Folks, I believe with all my heart God can do anything. I've seen people with stage four cancer be healed, folks. I've seen people that, you know, uh, when I first came here, I can't remember, the last name was Floyd, I can't remember, but he was an ex-Marine and he was working with the youth. I mean, the first year I was here, he had a massive heart attack and I was up at Mercy Hospital. The, the surgeon walked out and said, he has a 2% chance of living. Two. Man, we got a phone chain started. We prayed and we prayed and the pr we prayed. The man's still alive. He got diabetes. He got things wrong with him, but he's still alive today, folks. God can do anything. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for your word. And I love your word. I love the stories in your word. And God, they're not just stories. They're facts. And God, uh, when we can't, you can when we won't, <laughs> Lord, you, you will. There's times in our lives that, Lord, all we have is you. And God, I pray that we would be men and women of faith. God, I pray we would be men and women of prayer. I pray we would stand in the gap. Those ones that we have been praying for before and we just quit, Lord, I pray we'd start her back again. God, help us to be prayer warriors. And God, I just pray that we recognize that it's not over till you say it's over. So God, I thank you, but thank you for stories about Elijah and thank you, Lord, that you have proven who you are. And Lord, there's so many false gods. Baal is back here. Baal is showing his head. The, ho the whole spirit of Baal is here. I believe that. But God, you are stronger. So God, help us to just stand up for you. Help us to testify for you. And God, I pray when you do the miracle that, you will, that we will give you credit. God, it's not us. It's not about us. It's never been about us. It's about you and what you have done in our lives. God, thank you for salvation. Thank you that you speak to us. And God, I pray that we would act in faith as we walk in life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.